preface of the wings of the dove by henry james this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or how to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by aaron elliot st louis missouri preface the wings of the dove published in 1902, represents to my memory a very old, if I shouldn't perhaps rather say, a very young motive. I can scarce remember the time when the situation on which this long-drawn fiction mainly rests was not vividly present to me. The idea, reduced to a essence, is that of a young person, conscious of a great capacity for life, but early stricken and doomed, condemned to die, under short respite, while also enamored of the world, aware, moreover, of the condemnation, and passionately desiring to put in, before extinction, as many of the finer vibrations as possible, and so achieve, however briefly and brokenly, the sense of having lived." Long had I turned it over, standing off from it, yet coming back to it, convinced of what might be done with it, yet seeing the theme as formidable. The image so figured would be, at best, but half the matter, the rest be all the picture of the struggle involved, the adventure brought about, the gain recorded or the loss incurred, the precious experience somehow compassed. These things I had from the first felt would require much working out, that indeed was the case with most things worth working at all. Yet there are subjects and subjects, and this one seemed particularly to bristle. It was formed, I judged, to make the wary adventurer walk around and round it. It had in fact a charm that invited and mystified alike that attention not being somehow what one thought of as frank subject after the fashion of some with its elements well in view and its whole character in its face it stood there with secrets and compartments with possible treacheries and traps it might have a great deal to give but would probably ask for equal services in return and would collect this debt to the last shilling it involved, to begin with, the placing in the strongest light a person infirm and ill, a case sure to prove difficult and to require much handling, though given perhaps with other matters one of those chances for good taste, possibly even for the play of the very best in the world, that are not only always to be invoked and cultivated, but that are absolutely to be jumped at from the moment they make a sign. Yes, then, the case prescribed for its central figure, a sick young woman, at the whole course of whose disintegration and the whole ordeal of whose consciousness, one would have quite honestly to assist. The expression of her state, and that of one's intimate relation to it, might therefore well need to be discreet and ingenious, a reflection that fortunately grew and grew, however, in proportion as I focused my image, round about which, as it persisted, I repeat, the interesting possibilities, and the attaching wonderments, not to say, the insoluble mysteries, thickened apace. Why had one to look so straight in the face, and so closely to cross-question that idea of making one's protagonist sick? as if to be menaced with death or danger hadn't been from time immemorial for heroine or hero the very shortest of all cuts to the interesting state why should a figure be disqualified for a central position by the particular circumstance that might most quicken that might crown with a fine intensity its liability to many accidents its consciousness of all relations this circumstance true enough might disqualify it for many activities even though we should have imputed to it the unsurpassable activity of passionate of inspired resistance this last fact was the real issue for the way grew straight from the moment one recognized that the poet essentially can't be concerned with the act of dying 
let him deal with the sickest of the sick, it is still by the act of living that they appeal to him, and appeal the more as the conditions plot against them and prescribe the battle. The process of life gives way fighting, and often may so shine out on the lost ground as in no other connection. One had had, moreover, as a various chronicler, one's secondary physical weaklings and failures, one's accessory invalids introduced with a complacency that made light of criticism. To Ralph Touchette, in The Portrait of a Lady, for instance, his deplorable state of health was not only no drawback, I had clearly been right in counting it, for any happy effect he should produce, a positive good mark, a direct aid to pleasantness and vividness. The reason of this, moreover, could never in the world have been his fact of sex, since men among the mortality afflicted suffer on the whole more overtly and more grossly than women, and resist with a rudder an inferior strategy. I had thus to take that anomaly for what it was worth, and I give it here but as one of the ambiguities amid which my subject ended by making itself at home and seating itself quite in confidence. With the clearness I have just noted accordingly, the last thing in the world it proposed to itself was to be the record predominantly of a collapse. I don't mean to say that my offered victim was not present to my imagination constantly, as dragged by a greater force than any she herself could exert. She had been given me from far back as contesting every inch of the road, as catching at every object the grasp of which might make for delay, as clutching these things to the last moment of her strength. Such an attitude and such movements, the passion they expressed, and the success they in fact represented, what were they in truth but the soul of drama? Which is the portrayal, as we know, of a catastrophe determined in spite of oppositions. My young woman would herself be the opposition to the catastrophe announced by the associated fates, powers conspiring to a sinister end, and with their command of means finally achieving it, yet in such straits, really to stifle the sacred spark that obviously a creature so animated, an adversary so subtle, couldn't but be felt worthy under whatever weaknesses of the foreground and the limelight. She would meanwhile wish, moreover, all along, to live for particular things. She would found her struggle on particular human interests, which would inevitably determine, in respect to her, the attitude of other persons, persons, affected in such a manner as to make them part of the action. If her impulse to rest from her shrinking hour still as much of the fruit of life as possible, if this longing can take effect only by the aid of others, their participation, appealed to, entangled, and coerced, as they find themselves, becomes their drama too, that of their promoting her illusion under her importunity for reasons, for interests and advantages, from motives and points of view of their own. Some of these promptings, evidently, would be of the highest order, others doubtless mightn't, but they would make up together for her, contributively, her sum of experience, represent to her somehow, in good faith or in bad, what she should have known. Somehow, too, at such a rate, one would see the persons, subject to them drawn in, as by some pool of a lorelei, see them terrified and tempted and charmed, bribed away, it may even be, from more prescribed and natural orbits, inheriting from their connection with her strange difficulties and still stranger opportunities, confronted with rare questions and called upon for new discriminations. Thus the scheme of her situation would, in a comprehensive way, see itself constituted. The rest of the interest would be in the number and nature of the particulars. Strong among these, naturally, the need that life should, apart from her infirmity, present itself to our young woman as quite dazzlingly livable, and that 
if the great pang for her is in what she must give up, we shall appreciate it the more from the sight of all she has. One would see her, then, as possessed of all things, all but the single most precious assurance, freedom and money, and a mobile mind, and personal charm, the power to interest and attach, attributes, each one, enhancing the value of a future. From the moment his imagination began to deal with her at close quarters, in fact, nothing could more engage her designer than to work out the detail of her perfect rightness for her part. Nothing, above all, more solicit him than to recognize fifty reasons for her national and social status. She should be the last fine flower, blooming alone, for the fullest attestation of her freedom, of an old New York stem, the happy congruities thus preserved for her, being matters, however, that I may not now go into, and this, even though the fine association that shall yet elsewhere await me, is of a sort, at the best, rather to defy than to encourage exact expression there goes with it for the heroine of the wings of the dove a strong and special implication of liberty liberty of action of choice of appreciation of contact proceeding from sources that provide better for large independence i think than any other conditions in the world and this would be in particular what we should feel ourselves deeply concerned with I had, from far back, mentally projected a certain sort of young American as more the heir of all the ages than any other young person, whatever, and precisely on those grounds I have just glanced at, but to pass them by for the moment, so that there was a chance to confer on some such figure a supremely touching value. To be the heir of all the ages, only to know yourself, as that consciousness should deepen, balked of your inheritance, would be to play the part, it struck me, or at least to arrive at the type, in the light on the whole, the most becoming. Otherwise, truly, what a perilous part to play out, what a suspicion of swagger in positively attempting it. So, at least, I could reason, so I even think I had to, to keep my subject to a decent compactness. For already, from an early stage, it had begun richly to people itself. The difficulty was to see whom the situation I had primarily projected might, by this, that or the other turn, not draw in. My business was to watch its turns, as the fond parent watches a child perched, for its first riding lesson, in the saddle, yet its interest, I had all the while to recall, was just in its making, on such a scale, for developments. What one had discerned, at all events, from an early stage, was that a young person so devoted and exposed, a creature with her security hanging so by a hair, couldn't but fall somehow into some abysmal trap, this being, dramatically speaking, what such a situation most naturally implied and imposed. Didn't the truth and a great part of the interest also reside in the appearance that she would constitute for others, giving her passionate yearning to live while she might, a complication as great as any they might constitute for herself? Which is what I mean when I speak of such matters as natural. They would be as natural, these tragic, pathetic, ironic, these indeed for the most part sinister liabilities to her living associates as they could be to herself as prime subject. If her story was to consist, as it could so little help doing, of her being let in, as we say, for this, that, and the other, irreducible anxiety, how could she not have put a premium on the acquisition, by any close sharer of her life, of a consciousness similarly embarrassed? I have named the Rhine Maiden, but our young friend's existence would create rather all round her very much that whirlpool movement of the waters produced by the sinking of a big vessel, or the failure of a great business when we figure to ourselves the strong narrowing eddies, the immense force of suction, the general engulfment that, for any neighboring object, makes immersion 
inevitable. There goes with it, for the heroine of The Wings of the Dove, a strong and special implication of liberty, liberty of action, of choice, of appreciation, of contact, proceeding from sources that provide better for large independence, I think, than any other conditions in the world, and this would be in particular what we should feel ourselves deeply concerned with. I need scarce say, however, that in spite of these communities of doom, I saw the main dramatic complication much more prepared for my vessel of sensibility, than by her, the work of other hands, though with her own imbrued too, after all, in the measure of their never not being, in some direction, generous and extravagant, and thereby provoking. The great point was, at all events, that if in a predicament she was to be accordingly, it would be of the essence to create the predicament promptly and build it up solidly so that it should have for us as much as possible its ominous air of awaiting her that reflection i found betimes not less inspiring than urgent one begins so in such a business by looking about for one's compositional key unable as one can only be to move till one has found it to start without it is to pretend to enter the train, and, still more, to remain in one's seat without a ticket. Well, in the steady light, and for the continued charm of these verifications, I had secured my ticket over the tolerably long line laid down for the wings of the dove, from the moment I had noted that there could be no full presentation of Milly Thiel, as engaged with elements amid which she was to draw her breath in such pain, should not the elements have been, with all solicitude, duly prefigured. If one had seen that her stricken state was but half her case, the correlative half being the state of others as affected by her, they too should have a case, bless them, quite as much as she, then I was free to choose, as it were, the half with which I should begin. If, as I had fondly noted, the little world determined for her was to bristle, I delighted in the term, with meanings, so, by the same token, could I but make my metal hang free. Its obverse and its reverse, its face and its back, would beautifully become optional for the spectator. I somehow wanted them correspondingly embossed, wanted them inscribed and figured with an equal salience, yet it was none the less visibly my key, as I have said, that though my regenerate young New Yorker, and what might depend on her, should form my center, my circumference was every whit as treatable. Therefore I must trust myself to know when to proceed from the one and when from the other preparatively and, as it were, yearningly, given the whole ground, one began in the event with the outer ring, approaching the center, thus by narrowing circumvallations, there, full-blown accordingly, from one hour to the other, rose one's process, for which there remained, all the while, so many amusing formulae. The metal did hang free. I felt this perfectly, I remember, from the moment I had comfortably laid the ground, provided in my first book, ground from which Milly is superficially so absent. I scarce remember perhaps a case, I like even with this public grossness to insist on it, in which the curiosity of beginning far back, as far back as possible, and even of going to the same tune far behind, that is behind the face of the subject, was to assert itself with less scruple. The free hand in this connection was above all agreeable, the hand the freedom of which I owed to the fact that the work had ignominiously failed in advance of all power to see itself serialized. This failure had repeatedly waited for me upon shorter fictions, but the considerable production we here discuss was, as the Golden Bull was to be two or three years later, born not otherwise than a little bewilderedly, into a world of periodicals and editors, of roaring successes, in fine amid which it was well-nigh unnotedly to lose itself. 
There is fortunately something bracing ever in the alpine chill, that of some high icy aerate shed by the cold editorial shoulder, sour grapes may at moments fairly intoxicate, and the storyteller, worth his salt, rejoice to feel again how many accommodations he can practice. Those addressed to conditions of publication have in a degree their interesting, or at least their provoking, side, but their charm is qualified by the fact that the prescriptions here spring from a soil often wholly alien to the ground of the work itself. They are almost always the fruit of another air altogether, and conceived in a light liable to represent within the circle of the work itself little else than darkness. Still, when not too blighting, they often operate as a tax on ingenuity, that ingenuity of the expert craftsman, which likes to be taxed very much to the same tune to which a well-bred horse likes to be saddled. The best and finest ingenuities, nevertheless, with all respect to that truth, are apt to be, not one's can promises, but one's fullest conformities, and I well remember, in the case before us, the pleasure of feeling my divisions, my proportions and general rhythm, rest all on permanent rather than in any degree on momentary properties. It was enough for my alternations, thus, that they were good in themselves, it was in fact so much for them that I really think any further account of the constitution of the book reduces itself to a just notation of the law they followed. There was the fun, to begin with, of establishing one's successive centers, of fixing them so exactly that the portions of the subject commanded by them as by happy points of view and accordingly treated from them would constitute, so to speak, sufficiently solid blocks of wrought material squared to the sharp edge as to have weight and mass and carrying power to make for construction that is to conduce to effect and to provide for beauty such a block obviously is the whole preliminary presentation of kate croy which from the first i recall absolutely declined to enact itself save in terms of amplitude Terms of amplitude, terms of atmosphere, those terms and those terms only, in which images assert their fullness and roundness, their power to resolve, so that they have sides and backs, parts in the shade as true as parts in the sun, these were plainly to be my conditions right and left, and I was so far from overrating the amount of expression, the whole thing, as I saw and felt it would require, that to retrace the way at present is, alas, more than anything else, but to mark the gaps and the lapses, to miss, one by one, the intentions that, with the best will in the world, were not to fructify. I have just said that the process of the general attempt is described from the moment the blocks are numbered, and that would be a true enough picture of my plan. Yet one's plan, alas, is one thing, and one's result another. So that I am perhaps nearer the point in saying that this last strikes me at present as most characterized by the happy features that were, under my first and most blessed illusion, to have contributed to it. I meet them all. As I renew acquaintance, I mourn for them as I remount the stream, the absent values, the palpable voids, the missing links, the mocking shadows, that reflect, taken together, the early bloom of one's good faith. Such cases are, of course, far from abnormal, so far from it, that some acute mind ought surely to have worked out, by this time, the law of the degree in which the artist's energy fairly depends on his fallibility. How much and how often, and in what connections, and with what almost infinite variety must he be a dupe, that of his prime object to be all measurably a master, that of his actual substitute for it, or in other words, at all appreciably to exist. 
he places after an earnest survey the piers of his bridge he has at least sounded deep enough heaven knows for their brave position yet the bridge spans the stream after the fact in apparently complete independence of these properties the principal grace of the original design they were an illusion for the necessary hour but the span itself whether of a single arch or of many seems by the oddest chance in the world to be a reality since actually the rueful builder passing under it sees figures and hears sounds above he makes out with his heart in his throat that it bears and is positively being used the building up of Kate Croy's consciousness to the capacity for the load little by little to be laid on it was, by way of example, to have been a matter of as many hundred close-packed bricks as there are actually poor dozens. The image of her so compromised and compromising father was all effectively to have pervaded her life, was in a certain particular way to have tampered with her spring, by which I mean that the shame and the irritation and the depression, the general poisonous influence of him, were to have been shown with a truth beyond the compass even of one's most emphasized word of honor for it, to do these things. But where do we find him at this time of day, save in a beggarly scene or two which scarce arrives at the dignity of functional reference? He but looks in, poor, beautiful, dazzling, damning apparition that he was to have been. He sees his place so taken, his company so little missed, that cocking again that fine form of hat, which has yielded him for so long his one effective cover, he turns away with a whistle of indifference that nobly misrepresents the deepest disappointment of his life. One's poor word of honor has had to pass muster for the show. Everyone, in short, was to have enjoyed so much better a chance that, like stars of the theater condescending to oblige, they have had to take small parts to content themselves with minor identities in order to come on at all. I haven't the heart now, I confess, to adduce the detail of so many lapsed importances, the explanation of most of which, after all, I take to have been in the crudity of a truth beating full upon me through these reconsiderations, the odd inveteracy of which picture at most any turn is jealous of drama, and drama, though on the whole with a greater patience, I think, suspicious of picture. Between them, no doubt, they do much for the theme, yet each baffles insidiously the other's ideal and eats round the edges of its position. Each is too ready to say, I can take the thing for done, only one done in my way. The residuum of comfort for the witness of these broils is, of course, meanwhile, in the convenient reflection invented for him in the twilight of time and the infancy of art by the angel, not to say by the demon of compromise, that nothing is so easy to do as not to be thankful for almost any stray help in its getting done. It wasn't after this fashion, by making good one's dream of Lionel Croy, that my structure was to stand on its feet any more than it was by letting him go that I was to be left irretrievably lamenting. The who and the what, the how and the why, the whence and the whither of Merton Densher, these, no less, were quantities and attributes that should have danced about him with the antique grace of nymphs and fawns circling round a bland Hermes and crowning him with flowers. One's main anxiety for each one's agents is that the heir of each shall be given, but what does the whole thing become, after all, as one goes, but a series of sad places at which the hand of generosity has been cautioned and stayed? 
the young man's situation personal professional social was to have been so decanted for us that we should get all the taste we were to have been penetrated with mrs louder by the same token saturated with her presence her personality and felt all her weight in the scale we were to have reveled in mrs stringham my heroine's attendant friend her fairly choral bostonian a subject for innumerable touches and in an extended and above all an animated reflection of milly field's experience of english society just as the strength and sense of the situation in venice for our gathered friends was to have come to us in a deeper draught out of a larger cup and just as the pattern of Densher's final position and fullness, consciousness, there was to have been marked in fine stitches, all silk and gold, all pink and silver, that have had to remain, alas, but entwined upon the reel. It isn't no doubt, however, to recover, after all, our critical balance that the pattern didn't, for each compartment, get itself somehow wrought, and that we mightn't thus, piece by piece, opportunity offering, trace it over and study it. The thing has doubtless, as a whole, the advantage that each piece is true to its pattern, and that while it pretends to make no simple statement, it yet never lets go its scheme of clearness applications of this theme are continuous and exemplary enough though i scarce leave myself room to glance at them the clearness is obtained in book first or otherwise as i have said in the first piece each book having its subordinate and contributive pattern through the associated consciousness of my two prime young persons for whom i early recognized that i should have to consent under stress to a practical fusion of consciousness it is into the young woman's ken that merton densher is represented as swimming but her mind is not here rigorously the one reflector there are occasions when it plays this part just as there are others when his plays it and an intelligible plan consists naturally not a little in fixing such occasions and making them on one side and the other sufficient to themselves do i sometimes in fact forfeit the advantage of that distinctness do i ever abandon one centre for another after the former has been postulated from the moment we proceed by centers, and I have never, I confess, embraced the logic of any superior process, they must be each as a basis selected and fixed, after which it is that, in the high interest of economy of treatment, they determine and rule. There is no economy of treatment without an adopted, a related point of view, and though I understand, under certain degrees of pressure, a represented community of vision between several parties, to the action when it makes for concentration, I understand no breaking up of the register to sacrifice of the recording consistency that doesn't rather scatter and weaken. In this truth resides the secret of the discriminated occasion, that aspect of the subject which we have our noted choice of treating either as picture or scenically, but which is apt, I think, to show its fullest worth in the scene. Beautiful exceedingly, for that matter, those occasions or parts of an occasion when the boundary line between picture and scene bears a little the weight of the double pressure such would be the case i can't but surmise for the long passage that forms here before us the opening of book fourth where all the offered life centers to intensity in the disclosure of milly's single throbbing consciousness but where for a due rendering everything has to be brought to a head this passage the view of her introduction to mrs louder's circle has its mate for illustration later on in the book and at a crisis for which the occasion submits to another rule 
my registers or reflectors as i so conveniently name them burnished indeed as they generally are by the intelligence the curiosity the passion the force of the moment whatever it be directing them work as we have seen in arranged alternation so that in the second connection i hear glance and it is Kate Croy who is, for all she is worth, turned on. She is turned on largely at Venice, where the appearance is rich and obscure and portentous, another word I rejoice in, as they have by that time become and altogether exquisite as they remain, are treated almost wholly through her vision of them, and dentures as to the lucid interplay of which conspiring and conflicting agents there would be a great deal to say. It is in Kate's consciousness that at the stage in question the drama is brought to a head, and the occasion on which, in the splendid saloon of poor Milly's hired palace, she takes the measure of her friend's festal evening, squares itself to the same synthetic firmness as the compact constructional block inserted by the scene at Lancaster Gate. Milly's situation ceases at a given moment to be renderable in terms closer than those supplied by Kate's intelligence, or, in a richer degree, by Densher's, or, for one fond hour, by poor Mrs. Stringham's, since to that sole brief futility it is this last participant crowned by my original plan, with the quaintest functions in fact reduced, just as Kate's relation with Densher, and Densher's with Kate, have ceased previously, and are then to cease again to be projected for us, so far as Milly is concerned with them, on any more reasonable plate than that of the latter's admirable anxiety. It is as if, for these aspects, the impersonal plate, in other words, the poor author's comparatively cold affirmation or thin guarantee, had felt itself a figure of attestation, at once too gross and too bloodless, likely to affect us as an abuse of privilege when not as an abuse of knowledge. Heaven forbid, we say to ourselves, during almost the whole Venetian climax, heaven forbid we should know anything more of our ravaged sister than what Densher darkly pieces together, or than what Kate Croy pays heroically, it must be owned, at the hour of her visit alone, to Densher's lodging for her superior handling and her dire profanation of. For we have time, while this passage lasts, to turn round critically, we have time to recognize intentions and properties, we have time to catch glimpses of an economy of composition, as I put it, interesting in itself, all in spite of the author's scarce, more than half dissimulated despair at the inveterate displacement of his general center. The Wings of the Dove happens to offer perhaps the most striking example I may cite, though with public penance for it already performed, of my regular failure to keep the appointed halves of my whole equal. Here the makeshift middle, for which the best I can say is that it's always rueful and never impudent, reigns with even more than its customary contrition, though passing itself off perhaps too with more than its usual craft. Nowhere, I seem to recall, had the need of dissimulation been felt so as anguish, nowhere had I condemned a luckless theme to complete its revolution, burdened with the accumulation of its difficulties, the difficulties that grow with a theme's development in quarters so cramped. Of course, as every novelist knows, it is difficulty that inspires only for that perfection of charm. It must have been difficulty inherent and congenital, and not difficulty caught by the wrong frequentations. The latter half, that is the false and deformed half of the wings, would verily, I think, form a single object lesson for a literary critic bent on improving his occasion to the profit of the budding artist. 
this whole corner of the picture bristles with dodges such as he should feel himself all committed to recognize and denounce for disguising the reduced scale of the exhibition for foreshortening at any cost for imparting to patches the value of presences for dressing objects in an air as of the dimensions they can't possibly have thus he would have his free hand for pointing out what a tangled web we weave when well when through our mislaying of otherwise trifling with our blessed pair of compasses we have to produce the illusion of mass without the illusion of extent there is a job quite to the measure of most of our monitors and with the interest for them well enhanced by the preliminary cunning quest for the spot where deformity has begun i recognize meanwhile throughout the long earlier reach of the book not only no deformities but i think a positively close and felicitous application of method the preserved consistencies of which often elusive but never really lapsing it would be of a certain diversion and might be of some profit to follow the author's accepted task at the outset has been to suggest with force the nature of the tie formed between the two young persons first introduced to give the full impression of its peculiar worried and baffled yet clinging and confident ardor the picture constituted so far as may be is that of a pair of natures well nigh consumed by a sense of their intimate affinity and congruity the reciprocity of their desire and thus passionately impatient of barriers and delays yet with qualities of intelligence and character that they are meanwhile extraordinarily able to draw upon for the enrichment of their relation the extension of their prospect and the support of their game they are far from a common couple merton densher and kate croy as befits the remarkable fashion in which fortune was to waylay the opportunity was to distinguish them the whole strange truth of their response to which opening involves also in its order no vulgar art of exhibition but what they have most to tell us is that all unconsciously and with the best faith in the world all by mere force of the terms of their superior passion combined with their superior diplomacy they are laying a trap for the great innocence to come if i like as i have confessed the portentous look i was perhaps never to set so high a value on it as for all this prompt provision of forces unwittingly waiting to close round my eager heroine to the eventual deep chill of her eagerness as the result of her mere lifting of a latch infinitely interesting to have built up the relation of the others to the point at which its aching restlessness its need to affirm itself otherwise than by an exasperated patience meets as with instinctive relief and recognition the possibilities shining out of milly thiel infinitely interesting to have prepared and organized correspondingly that young woman's precipitations and liabilities to have constructed for drama essentially to take possession the whole bright house of her exposure these references however reflect too little of the detail of the treatment imposed such a detail as i for instance get hold of in the fact of denture's interview with mrs louder before he goes to america it forms in this preliminary picture the one patch not strictly seen over kate croy's shoulder though it's notable that immediately after at the first possible moment we surrender again to our major convenience as it happens to be at the time that of our drawing breath through the young woman's lungs once more in other words before we know it densher's direct vision of the scene at lancaster gate is replaced by her apprehension her contributive assimilation of his experience it melts back into that accumulation which we have been as it were saving up does my apparent deviation here count accordingly as a muddle one of the muddles ever blooming so thick in any soil that fails to grow reason and determinants 
No, distinctly not, for I had definitely opened the door, as attention of perusal of the first two books will show to the subjective community of my young pair. Attention of perusal, I thus confess, by the way, it is what I, at every point, as well as here, absolutely invoke, and take for granted a truth I avail myself of this occasion to note once for all, in the interest of that variety of ideal reigning I gather in the connection. The enjoyment of a work of art, the acceptance of an irresistible illusion, constituting to my sense our highest experience of luxury, the luxury is not greatest by my consequent measure when the work asks for as little attention as possible. It is greatest, it is delightfully, divinely great, when we feel the surface, like the thick ice of the skater's pond, bear without cracking the strongest pressure we throw on it. The sound of the crack one may recognize, but never surely to call it a luxury. That I had scarce availed myself of the privilege of seeing with Venture's eyes is another matter. The point is that I had intelligently marked my possible, my occasional need of it. So, at all events, the constructional block of the first two books compactly forms itself. A new block of all the squarest and not a little of the smoothest begins with the third, by which I mean, of course, a new mass of interest governed from a new center. Here again I make prudent provision to be sure to keep my center strong. It dwells mainly, we at once see, in the depths of Milly Thiel's case, where close beside it, however, we meet a supplementary reflector, that of the lucid, even though so quivering spirit of her dedicated friend. The more or less associated consciousness of the two women deals thus unequally with the next presented face of the subject deals with it to the exclusion of the dealing of others, and if, for a highly particular moment, I allot to Mrs. Stringham the responsibility of the direct appeal to us, it is again charming to relate, on behalf of that play of the portentous which I cherish so as a value, and am accordingly forever setting in motion. There is an hour of evening on the alpine height at which it becomes of the last importance that our young woman should testify eminently in this direction. But, as I was to find it, long since of a blessed wisdom that no expense should be incurred or met in any corner of picture of mine, without some concrete image of the account kept of it, that is, of its being organically re-economized so under that dispensation Mrs. Stringham has to register the transaction. Book Fifth is a new block mainly in its provision of a new set of occasions, which readopt for their order the previous center, Milly's now almost full-blown consciousness. At my game, with renewed zest of driving portents home, I have by this time all the choice of those that are to brush that surface with a dark wing. They are used to our profit on an elastic but a definite system, by which I mean that having to sound here and there a little deep as a test for my basis of method, I find it everywhere obstinately present. It draws the occasion into tune and keeps it so, to repeat my tiresome term, my nearest approach to muddlement is to have sometimes, but not too often, to break my occasions small. Some of them succeed in remaining ample, and in really aspiring then to the higher the sustained lucidity. The whole actual center of the work, resting on a misplaced pivot and lodged in Book Fifth, pretends to a long reach, or at any rate to the larger foreshortening, though bringing home to me on re-perusal, what I find striking, charming, and curious, the author's instinct everywhere for the indirect presentation of his main image. I note how, again and again, I go but a little way with the direct, 
that is with the straight exhibition of milly it resorts for relief this process whenever it can to some kinder some merciful indirection all as if to approach her circuitously deal with her at second hand as an unspotted princess is ever dealt with the pressure all round her kept easy for her the sounds the movements regulated the forms and ambiguities made charming all of which proceeds obviously from her painter's tenderness of imagination about her which reduces him to watching her as it were through the successive windows of other people's interest in her so if we may talk of princesses do the balconies opposite the palace's gates do the coigens of vantage and respect enjoyed for a fee rake from afar the mystic figure in the gilded coach as it comes forth into the great place but my use of windows and balconies is doubtless at best an extravagance by itself and as to what there may be to note of this and other super subtleties other arch refinements of tact and taste of design and instinct in the wings of the dove i become conscious of overstepping my space without having brought the full quantity to light the failure leaves me with a burden of residuary comment of which i yet boldly hope elsewhere to discharge myself end of preface this has been a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain